Hello everyone, so today we are going to be looking at three cold cases that seem as if there is no end in sight, that they will never find this perpetrator. And to me, the most frustrating thing that coincides with a lot of cold cases is there is often a lot of bad police work, a lot of things that go wrong on investigators end and police end, and there's always a lack of evidence or so much evidence that is not able to be linked to anybody in particular. So it always feels very frustrating looking over these cold cases because of those two things specifically for me. And before we jump in, don't forget to hit that subscription button down below so you could be alerted every time I post a new true crime case, which which is about two times a week. On December 30th, 2000, at around 11.30 p.m., an unknown killer entered the home of the Miyazawa family in Seta Taiga, Japan. He entered the home through an open window in the second story bathroom in the back of the home. This side of the house was right next to a park and the killer climbed a tree to enter the window after he removed the window screen. He used his bare hands to strangle Ray, the six-year-old son of the family, until he died and his father Miyoko rushed up the stairs and fought the killer until he was stabbed in the head, in which the end of the blade broke off. The killer then attacked Miyoko's wife Yasuko and their eight-year-old daughter Nina with a broken knife and used the knife from the family's kitchen to murder them. What is disheartening about this case is the surprising amount of evidence that was left behind, but investigators have found it a challenge to find the killer because it is most likely that they were foreign. The killer stayed in the home for some time between 2 to 10 hours. He used the family computer, drank four bottles of tea, ate some melon, and ate four ice creams. He also used the bathroom to clean up any injuries he sustained and used the toilet and left behind his feces without flushing. He also took a nap on the sofa and ransacked the house, leaving paperwork everywhere. He left behind several personal items as well, including a knife, a jacket, a sweater, and several other personal clothing items. He used the family computer at around 1.18 a.m. and again around 10 a.m., although some investigators believe that the computer may have been disrupted by Yasuko's mother, Haruko, who arrived and discovered the bodies. The killer unplugged the phone lines the night before, and she was worried about her family, so she entered the home and discovered the unfortunate crime scene. Investigators were able to determine the killer purchased the knife from the Kanagawa Prefecture and that the sweater that was left at the crime scene was from a small brand where only 130 of the sweaters were made. However, police were only able to track down 12 buyers of the sweater. The bag that was left behind was analyzed as well and trace amounts of sand was found determining the bag came from Edwards Air Force Base in California. With forensic evidence, the investigators were able to determine that the killer is a male and that he is most likely about five and a half feet tall with a thin build. It is estimated that he was born between 1965 and 1985, making him between the ages of 15 and 35 at the time of the murders, and he is most likely to be right-handed. So because the killer left a lot of his own blood after he cleaned his wounds in their bathroom, it was determined that this person was most likely mixed race and that his maternal side, uh, most likely his mother or maybe one of his mother's parents were European and that his father was East Asian. Although it has been later determined that this killer is not Japanese, that he was most likely Korean or Chinese with more emphasis being that he was most likely half Korean. And this case is still currently open, although every year that passes, more and more officers are taken off this case, and so it seems as if it will never be solved despite police having over about 12,500 pieces of evidence in their storage cabinets. It just seems like they are not able to link this with anyone in particular. And I'm most likely assuming that this person may have been in the country for a specific reason. They may not have lived in Japan, but they were traveling through or stayed there for some time. And because they fled the country, that it's really hard to find somebody after that happens, of course. So it seems as if they may never find this killer, but the family has fought really hard to continue to find this person who killed the family. On February 2nd, 2008, at about 10.45 a.m., the Lane Bryant in Tinley Park, Illinois, made a 911 call. 911 emergency. 
Then the phone went dead. The gunman bound and killed five women in a botched robbery at the store. A sixth woman was injured in the shooting, but police have yet to identify her. The gunman remains at large. On that call was Rhoda McFarland, who was the store manager at Lane Bryant. Her, as well as a part-time employee who remained unidentified, and four customers were taken to the back of the store and shot. The part-time employee was the only survivor. Police arrived at the scene to see the killer was gone, and at this point it is believed that this case was a robbery gone awry. The man was described by other shoppers in this strip mall type area that the man was of African American descent. He had a receding hairline, but his hair was cornrowed, and he had four light green beads at the end of each braid. Police received over two dozen leads the first day of the murders, but none of them has ever panned out. Lane Bryant, along with the Tinley Park community, offered a $100,000 reward for the information that would lead to the killer, but no other leads have ever come up. So this case has since gone cold, and there really haven't been any updates since 2008. There is a 3D a sketch, like a 3D scan of what this person may potentially look like, but really it's not really heavily detailed. It's very generic like so many people could look similar to this that it just seems as if this is never going to be solved which i find really sad and i also find it very odd that there is not a lot of like camera footage uh because this was in kind of like a strip mall type area and it seemed pretty busy that day and it just seems as if there was not uh any footage of this person like getting in and out of the car or getting dropped off or kind of like looking into the business to see um, if they should rob Lane Bryan or not or any stores that were close by and I just find that really sad that they've just been never you know been able to find uh, who did this because the women who died that day definitely deserve justice and so I hope that they continue to look for you know this person and now Lane Bryant, I believe, is completely closed. I don't think that they're even a company anymore, so I don't know if there's still that reward offer, but I still hope that this person does, um, you know, eventually get caught and we do find out who did this because it's absolutely terrible what happened. On June 6, 1992, Susie Streeter and Stacy McCall graduated from Kickapoo High School in Springfield, Missouri. On June 7th, the two girls attended several graduation parties together and planned to spend the evening at their friend Janelle Kirby's house. When they arrived at Janelle's house, it was too crowded from her graduation party, so the girls ended up going to Susie's house instead. The following morning around 9 a.m., Janelle and her boyfriend went to check on Susie and Stacy at Susie's home because she noticed they left her party and the three were planning on spending the day together at the water park. Janelle walked into the front door of Susie's home, which was unlocked, and found no sign of Susie or Stacy or Cheryl Levitt, who was Susie's mother. Cheryl was last heard from on June 6 at around 11.15 p.m. when she spoke to a friend on the phone. When Janelle arrived at the home, she found all three of the women's cars were parked outside and that the house was unlocked. The glass lampshade on the porch was shattered, although the light bulb was intact and the glass was swept off the porch by Janelle's boyfriend, which police later determined may have destroyed potential evidence. Janelle found Cheryl's dog, Cinnamon, who was a Yorkie inside, and she appeared to be agitated. She also received two phone calls from an unidentified male who spoke to her in a sexual manner while she was searching the home. Hours later, Stacy's mother, Janice, visited the home because she tried to call the house several times, and of course, no one answered the phone. Janice found all three women's purses sitting on the floor in the living room and Stacy's clothing folded neatly from the night before. Janice called the police from the home phone and after placing the call, she checked the answering machine and she heard a strange message, but it was accidentally erased from the machine. Police believed it may have contained a clue as to where the three women disappeared to. There were no signs of struggle in the home besides the porch light being broken and all personal items were left behind. And because it was 16 hours since the women were last seen, several people were in and out of the house to check on them before the police arrived. 
And because it was so long before the police were called and before they eventually arrived at the residence, it is believed that this crime scene was heavily corrupted because it's believed that between 10 and 20 people searched the house for the women before they called the police. Of course, we had Janelle and her boyfriend and Janice, and it's believed that several other family members came to the home in search of the three women. Some of them were Stacy's family. Some of them, of course, were Susie and Cheryl's family. So it's believed that this crime scene was heavily corrupted before the police could even look at anything. And of course, this is a big issue in the famous, you know, John Bonet Ramsey case that so many people walked through the home before the police even arrived that, you know, it's so hard to determine anything. They're not really able to use some of the footprints because it could have been a family member's footprint who was just checking. And so this is why it's so important why Janelle should have called the police right off the bat before even going in the house when she noticed that the door was unlocked. I'm quite sure she knocked before she walked in to see what was going on. Why it's important to call the police or you know just to see what is going on first before you walk in the house and check around because that often ruins evidence and that makes it a lot harder for them to figure out exactly what happened. On December 31st, 1992, a man called the America's Most Wanted hotline with pertinent information about the disappearances. But the call was disconnected when the switchboard operator attempted to connect the caller with Springfield investigators. Investigators publicly appealed for the man to contact them, but he never did. Investigators also received a tip from a psychic stating that the bodies of the three women were buried in the foundations of a parking garage at Cox Hospital. A mechanical engineer scanned the parking garage with a ground penetrating radar and found three anomalies that would be similar size to a grave site. Two anomalies were parallel and one was perpendicular. Police stated that the tip provided no evidence that the bodies would be buried there and that digging up the structure and then rebuilding it would be too costly, so they denied doing this. And I find the fact that investigators and the police from this town did not even attempt to check this location because we see sometimes in really like high profile cases such as the Dylan Redwine case that they used brand new sonar technology to search uh, like the rivers and everything in that local area in Colorado to see if they could find him. And I'm not saying they shouldn't have, of course they should, but it just seems odd that they'll do things like this for some cases, but some cases they won't. So I'm not sure if the family around these cases, um, like Stacy's family or other people in Susie's family, were not able to advocate for them as much or what was really going on with that because it seems like some cases they will really go very far to search for the body and they'll do just about anything to find it. So it seems really odd that they didn't do that for this. And of course, I understand, you know, breaking the foundation and digging up a lot of cement and things like that for a parking garage is very challenging and probably very expensive, but it just seems wrong not to do so, right? Especially because they did see that there was some sort of anomaly there was something underneath that foundation so it seems kind of wrong to not do so but also you know we can't control what they will put money towards but I do find it very sad that they will you know go so far for some people but other cases they won't do so and I find that really sad I feel like no matter what age race gender you are I do feel that they should put in the same amount of effort to find everybody the only suspect in this case is Robert Craig Cox who in 1997 was imprisoned in Texas as a kidnapper and robber and was a suspect in a murder in Florida. He told journalists that he knew the three women that were murdered and that their buried bodies would never be recovered. And in 1992, when the disappearances took place, Robert was living in Springfield and he claimed he was at church that morning with his girlfriend, which she corroborated at the time. Later, she recanted her statement, saying that Robert asked her to do so. Investigators cannot determine if Robert was involved with these disappearances and Robert has stated to authorities that he will disclose what happened to the three women after his mother passes away. Over the years, this case has been highlighted on several crime shows and podcasts and police have received thousands of tips from the public. So that leads me to believe if 
Robert was really involved, why he wouldn't just tell investigators and if he's just toying with them, which unfortunately does happen uh, quite frequently with true crime cases when you read about uh, certain things, like for instance, again, to bring up the John Bonnet Ramsey case for the second time in this video, you know, many people claimed to murder her that actually didn't. And so it is unfortunate that that does happen sometimes where a convict will say they did something just to for whatever reason get more fame or whatever the situation is why I'm not really understanding why they do that but that does happen and so it makes me wonder because he is a convicted kidnapper he is a convicted felon for other reasons and he was brought up on murder charges for another case so his mother already knows that he is not a great person so I'm not understanding why he has to wait till his mother passes away to disclose that information and I couldn't find how old his mother was or if she had passed from this time because of course this was like 23 almost 24 years ago so I'm not really sure on that I couldn't find information so I'm assuming his mother is still alive uh, as there have been no major like breakthroughs in this case but I just find that really weird and um, really sad right because he's just messing around with these family's feelings and their friends feelings because you know these three women went missing and it just kind of seems like we're not going to know what happened to them unless they can determine that Robert was involved in some way. Let me know if you guys like these cases, if you like these type of videos, or if you like the full length uh, true crime videos where I just talk about one case. Let me know what you prefer. I enjoy doing both. And if there are any other cases you want me to cover or a specific case that I've made that you want me to elaborate on and make a longer video about, please let me know in the comments. And of course, if anybody has any information regarding these crimes that we talked about today or any crimes that I've talked about in my videos, please always check the description box for ways to contact anybody that is involved with that case, whether it be the FBI or if there's like a personal hotline. I always try to leave that in the, in the description box as best as possible. So always leave me a comment down below and let me know if you found this interesting. And otherwise, I hope you guys have a great day and stay safe out there. Bye-bye.